Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cato Institute, and it's my pleasure uh, uh, to welcome you today to a book forum uh, on a new book by Matt Ridley called The Rational Optimist, How Prosperity Evolves. My name is Brink Lindsay, and I'm Vice President for Research here at Cato. Writing a book like The, uh, the Rational Optimist was truly an audacious endeavor uh, for, as the author well knows from writing this book, and as he will have confirmed for him again and again as he goes about trying to sell it, for every flickering flame of rational optimism uh, there is in the world, there are enormous gales of irrational pessimism huffing and puffing and trying to blow it out. I know this from personal experience. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote an optimistic book called The Age of Abundance about how American society has become much richer, freer, and fairer, despite the best efforts of lots of very earnest and very serious people to screw everything up. And like the book that uh, we're discussing today, I argued that the driving force behind all this progress was our continued elaboration of the division of labor through specialization and exchange. Uh, I wish Matt all the best, uh, but my sales figures attest to the fact uh, that this is not a message uh, that resonates very well in the current political environment. Uh, on the left, you have true believers deeply committed to a story of economic decline uh, since the 1970s, according to this story. Basically, nobody's uh, better off except for a tiny few perched at the top of the income pyramid. Meanwhile, true believers on the right are just as committed to a story of cultural decline. The world's been going to a hell in the handbasket uh, since the 1960s. Gay marriage is destroying the family. Mexican immigration is destroying our culture, and so forth. <clears throat> well, Matt Ridley is painting on a much broader canvas, not America over the past 50 years or so, but all of humanity over the past 200,000 years. So perhaps in that expanse of ambition of his thesis, uh, uh, he can hide more from uh, <laughs> Uh, the angry types that confronted me. <clears throat> he documents in great and entertaining detail the astonishing progress uh, made by our species. Uh, and uh, I know that at least some people aren't going to like it one little bit. It's, uh, it's a strange thing how deeply attached people are to their fears. Uh, it's not that way in our personal lives. Uh, when it comes to thinking about our own lives, we tend to be cockeyed, irrational optimists. Uh, one uh, study shows that 93% of Americans believe that they are above average drivers. Uh, uh, and in, uh, in one of the many amusing statistics uh, from this book, 19% of Americans believe they're in the top 1% of income earners. In our own lives, if we receive some scare, if we uh, get a medical test that suggests the possibility of cancer, but then further tests come in and show that we're really okay, we're totally overjoyed. But it's not like that uh, with regard to our opinions about the larger world, particularly about how the present stacks up against the past and how the future is likely to go. Uh, when we're th thinking about the larger world, pessimism reigns. Uh, Woody Allen pretty much nailed the prevailing outlook when he said, more than any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other, to total extinction. Let us, let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. <laughs> Doomsaying, as Matt Ridley uh, notes in his book, is taken as a sign of wisdom and profundity. Only shallow fools are optimistic. And if you try to convince anybody that their fears of the future are actually unfounded, you don't get the same reaction that uh, the doc gets when he tells you that the follow-up tests show you're in perfect health. No tears of joy, no grateful hugs, just unabated fury. <clears throat> if you doubt me, Try telling a right-winger that Mexican immigrants, uh, Mexican immigrants <clears throat> are assimilating just fine and that crime rates actually go down when immigration goes up. Or try telling a left-winger that climate change is unlikely to lead to catastrophe. So why are people so invested in their pessimism? Here's an optimistic take on pessimism. Uh, it's, uh, part of it, at least, is a quirky side effect of the wonderful creative dynamism of modern society. In a society geared towards incessant change along numberless dimensions, countless groups of people are constantly pushing for change. And there's no more effective way of arguing for change than to convince people that disaster lurks if you don't do what they want. <clears throat> so much of the bias towards doom and gloom then, I think, is just hype associated with incessant reformist salesmanship. And that's why people react so angrily uh, when you tell them that a problem isn't as big as they fear. That means that the pet reform they're peddling isn't as urges, urgently necessary as they suggest. 
Another reason for this prevailing pessimism lies in the fact that progress measurable over the course of a human life uh, is r relatively shockingly new in the scheme of things, really just over the past 200 years of history. Let's call that seven generations. For the prior 7,000 generations of human existence, improvements in the lives of ordinary people were modest and few and spaced out over centuries and millennia. The idea of open-ended, continuing progress, then, is still a breathtaking novelty. And it's not too surprising we really haven't wrapped our minds around it yet. Uh, cultural habits of mind built up over millennia uh, are still with us through the simple power of inertia. Uh, but uh, maybe, uh, I'm being uh, too upbeat, maybe pessimism is deeply rooted in human psychology. Can the world really ever seem as magical and wonderful as it did when we were children, or even better, when we were hormonally besotted college kids? <laughs> For the middle-aged and older pundits who pontificate about the state of the world, doesn't it feel obvious that the world has gone downhill? And when we contemplate the far future, the future that doesn't include us, doesn't it feel obvious that that prospect is nightmarish? Well, I'm an optimist, so I think rational optimism is a growth stock. Uh, the more we learn, the more we understand, the more optimistic we are likely to become. So I salute Matt Ridley for this wonderful book that improves our understanding and dares us to be upbeat. Let me introduce Matt. Matt is uh, best known uh, for uh, a series of wonderful popular science books, uh, starting with 1993's The Red Queen, Sex and the Evolution of Human Nature, followed up by, uh, 1996, The Origins of Virtue, Human Instincts and the Evolution of Cooperation, 1999, Genome, The Autobiography of a Species in 23 Chapters. In 2003, he came through with Nature via Nurture, Genes, Experience, and What Makes Us Human. Uh, in 2006, a biography of Francis Crick, and now uh, The Rational Optimist. Matt was educated at Oxford, where he received a uh, doctorate in zoology. Uh, he uh, worked for a time at my favorite magazine, The Economist, uh, in the mid-80s to early 90s, uh, variously as uh, science editor, Washington correspondent, and American editor. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Matt. Thank you, Brink, very much indeed for that. Uh, well, I think it was a kind introduction. I, I'm now, I was an optimist about how this book was going to go down, but maybe, maybe I need to re reconsider. Um, there's some, some frightening things coming my way by the sound of it. Um, and and uh, you're absolutely right. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be back in, in Washington and at Cato because uh, when I was here in the late 80s, um, I caught a, 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 a disease called free market economics. And... Um, uh, which I hadn't been exposed to in Europe. And uh, um, Cato played a large part in that, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, it's also wonderful to be here with, with Brink, whose incredible book and was extraordinarily influential on me and uh, who really has, I think, got to the heart of the matter. And with Robin, who has had to read the book twice, not only for today's event, but in a very early draft um, about a year ago when he kindly joined a group of people to critique and comment on it. So um, uh, I, I'm very honored that... that uh, these two and indeed some other names and faces of, uh, in the audience, who I'm, many of whom I'm ruthlessly plagiarizing. I'm looking at Don Boudreau and Indo Goklani and people like that who, who've had all these ideas before me. But then that's the point of my book, is that ideas come together and share and cooperate. So it's all right, really, if I steal their <laughs> ideas. What I just want to do was just run through a, a, a few slides, just partly to give you something to look at other than me. Um, and they're not so much about the, um, the sandwich parts of the book, the bits at the beginning and the end, which are about how life's getting better and it's going to go on getting better. Um, they're about uh, the subtitle, if you like, How Prosperity Evolves. Um, because I suspect that a lot of the economic news is, is what you know, but some of the stuff about archaeology and anthropology and, and what, w how this process of enrichment got going in our species and only in our species and why it happened when it did and where it did is something that I think um, uh, s has certainly surprised me and might, might surprise you. Um, so essentially what I want to do is, uh, is try and explain how we went from making things like this uh, to making things like this. 
this is a real photograph. These are both objects that sit on my desk at home. Uh, and of course, um, one, is, one was made to the same design for half a million years uh, with very little change um, uh, between about one and a half million years ago and half a million years ago. These kind of Ashwellian hand axes were made. Uh, and the other is obsolete already after five years. Um, and that, of course, is the problem. Um, and it's more interesting than that. The, the, the fact that they're the same size and the same shape is not interesting, actually. That just tells you they were both designed for the human hand. Um, the interesting thing is the difference, that the one on the left was made by uh, one person for himself. Uh, the one on the left was made by, I don't know, a million people uh, for me, um, <laughs> by kind people who were supplying me with the need for a computer mouse. Um, but just before I get onto that, how much better is the world in my lifetime? I was born in 1958, but if you take 1955 as a starting point, because it's a round number, uh, life expectancy globally is up a third. Per capita income has trebled, allowing for inflation. Food per capita, calories per capita are up a third. Child mortality down two thirds. That's an extraordinary achievement, an extraordinary extinction of pain and misery. Um, and of course, population growth rate has halved in my lifetime. These are amazing uh, achievements. And um, as Robin has pointed out so, so well, a lot of this is very recent. It, there is a huge uh, inflection point in the graph around 1800, um, which is basically, I think, when we can amplify our efforts on behalf of each other with fossil fuels, um, though there are other explanations, I know. But nonetheless, I want to track this progress of our species back a lot further than that, because something odd happened 45,000 years ago or longer, when we went from being just an ordinary um, predatory ape um, to having to experiencing this thing called progress and to changing our technology and changing our way of life and changing our population density in an, in an ever escalating way, even though, as Brink pointed out, the escalation was jolly slow for a very long time. Um, the, uh, this is my attempt to, to recalculate from William Nordhaus's study just an example of how much better life has got. It, if you want to read a book for an hour by the light of a compact fluorescent bulb, uh, it roughly costs you a quarter, a half a second of work at the average wage today. Um, if you did so in 1950, it would have cost you eight seconds of work. Um, by a kerosene lamp in 1880, 15 minutes of work. Uh, and a tallow candle, uh, you would have had to work for six hours to earn enough money to buy an hour of reading light in 1800, which only tells you that the person on the average wage in 1800 couldn't even afford a candle. Um, and of course, a lot of this stuff is not even captured in uh, per capita GDP or per capita income numbers. Here's a rich chap, um, Louis XIV, um, Sun King, richest man in France, probably, of his day. Um, and uh, he was rich because he had people to do things for him. Somebody made that silly outfit that he's wearing for him. Somebody made his hair curly. And he had 498 people to prepare his dinner every night. Um, here's a modern tourist in the Palace of Versailles in the Hall of Mirrors. And she's not rich. She's an ordinary person. Uh, she's totally average in every way. And yet, Somebody made those jeans for her, and somebody made that audio tourist thing she's holding, and somebody made the electricity that lit, light, lit the candelabra behind her. And in fact, she's got 498 people preparing her dinner tonight. They're in restaurants all over Paris, um, and the, but they're ready to serve her at an hour's notice. And that, of course, is what wealth is. It's that we are, prosperity is. It's that we're working for each other in a way that enables us all to be like Louis XIV. When did this start? What was the very first time when we started working for each other? Well, it probably is something to do with the sexual division of labor. If you study hunter-gatherers, you find that there is a, a, a hard and fast rule that there's always a difference in the way the sexes forage. Um, uh, males forage differently from females. It's usually male hunting and female gathering, although it doesn't map quite onto that. Um, and uh, the effect is that one sex is working for the other. Um, the males know that um, if they fail to catch uh, a warthog one day, uh, there will at least be something to eat because um, the 
females will have dug up some roots. Uh, the females know that they don't have to go out hunting to get protein. All they have to do is dig up a few extra roots to trade them for a bit of meat from the men and so on. So both sexes benefit, obviously, from the sexual division of labor. And there is a big question mark about how deeply rooted this is in human nature. Um, uh, until very recently, most people assumed it went back several million years. But I think the burden of proof has now been thrown rather back on that by the work of Mary Stein and Steve Kuhn, uh, Steiner and Steve Kuhn, who say that um, they don't think there's any evidence that Neanderthals had this, uh, th that it must have been an African invention of the last couple of hundred thousand years or so. And if you think about it, the invention of farming is also about people working for each other, except in this case it's different species working for each other. Here are three species working for each other, the dog, the sheep, and the man. They're all working for each other, and that's what makes the system work. Farming is a division of labor. Now, there are other divisions of labor in other animals. Um, a worker ant feeding a queen ant is working for the queen, and the queen is working for the worker because she's producing uh, the worker's nieces as babies. Um, uh, but in every case in other animals, these kinds of patterns are actually uh, within the family. An ant colony is just one big family. Um, and even in England, we don't leave reproduction to the queen. It's the one... It, <laughs> <laughs> a good thing to um, it's the one division of labor that we simply don't do as human beings so the great human trick has been to do this kind of ant colony thing where which is all based on a division of labor but to generalize it beyond the kin group or the, the family the mating mated pair to actually be able to do it among strangers and of course that um, is is the, the story of human progress the puzzle is the Neanderthals we're now clear that they had big brains on average, slightly bigger than ours. Um, they used plenty of tools. Um, they cooked their food, which meant that they could uh, free more calories from their food uh, than if they hadn't. They clearly had imaginations. They buried their dead. Um, and we now know from looking at the FOXP2 mutations in human beings and in the Neanderthal genome uh, that they probably spoke. We can't, of course, prove that they had language, but these peculiar mutations that seem to have come into our genome uh, in response to the uh, origin of speech are present in them too. So it looks like language um, predates the uh, divergence of Neanderthals and us. And yet, Neanderthals never experienced progress. There was no change in their toolkit of any significance over the uh, several hundred thousand years they were in Europe. Um, and right up until the end, 30,000 years ago, they were making the same tools. Uh, and they had, they had not shifted their niche to eat different things or, uh, or increased their population density or anything until we came along and brushed them aside. Although we now know that we, in brushing them aside, we got a few of their genes on board as well, which is an interesting discovery, but not many. The difference is they didn't exchange. The fascinating thing about Neanderthal tools is they are never found more than a few hours' walk from the site of manufacture. There is no evidence, therefore, of trade, of, of objects moving from one person to another. If you look at stone tools in relatively modern Australia, like this hand axe from a place called Mount Isa in northern Australia, um, uh, you, can, you can show that the, these objects moved over very long distances because of trade, not because of migration, but because of trade. Um, the, the, the Mount Isa quarry was owned by a tribe called the Kalkadun, um, who traded it. This is the, the trading network. And you can actually work out exchange rates that were, were in operation in the 19th century, how many stingray barbs it took to buy a stone axe at different places along a trading route and so on. Um, and the stone axes of Mount Isa ended up distributed all over a large chunk of Australia. You simply don't get that in any Neanderthal society, but you do get it in our ancestors, starting in Africa, starting around 120,000 years ago. This is the earliest evidence I've been able to find of, of trade. These are, are uh, marine shells being used as beads um, found in Algeria um, up to 100 miles inland, up to 125 miles inland in some cases. That looks like they're passing from hand to hand. And around the same time, but it's harder to date, there are some obsidian tools in, in Ethiopia that start moving long distances. So something's happened that enables us to uh, exchange uh, and therefore specialize and therefore uh, work for each other uh, around this time. 
There's a really nice control experiment for this in the case of Tasmania, which was colonized about 35,000 years ago uh, when it was still a peninsula of Australia. Um, and the Tasmanians who lived there went on making stone tools and using them in the same way as other Australians until 10,000 years ago when rising sea levels cut Tasmania off and made it into an island at the end of the Ice Age. And the 4,000 or so people who were marooned on the island for the next 10,000 years um, uh, experienced something really rather remarkable, which was that their technology regressed rather than progressed. They actually gave up the ability to make stone tools, uh, the, sorry, bone tools. Uh, they gave up the ability to make clothing. Uh, they gave up the, the ability to go fishing. Um, and they gave up um, the ability to make boats, although they did later reinvent a boat which was made of brushwood sheaves. It sank after an hour. Men sat on it. Women propelled it by swimming. Um, <laughs> apparently. Um, now, what's going on here is that the Tasmanians were not getting stupider. There was nothing wrong with their brains. What was happening was that their collective brain uh, was too small to sustain these technologies. It's, it's as if the people in this room had, uh, were all marooned on a desert island together for a very long time. The number of technologies we could sustain that we have inherited, like spectacles and uh, mobile phones and things that we could uh, managed to work out how to make among ourselves would be a lot smaller than the ones we'd inherited at the start. And there's a nice control for this, which is Tierra del Fuego, a very similar island, similarly cold and inhospitable, um, populated by a similar number of hunter-gatherers for the same length of time, 10,000 years, but no technological regress. Why not? Because the Magellan Strait is a lot narrower than the Bass Strait, and there was trading uh, all the time across it among the Indians. So they had access to a continental-sized collective brain, uh, whereas the Tasmanians had only a small collective brain. And the point, of course, is that the, 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 what human beings did when they started exchanging was that they no, were no longer limited by the size of their own brains. They were capable of inventing uh, many more things because they didn't have to store the knowledge um, within their own heads. They could store it between society. Because when you, if you go back to this image, Famously, Leonard Reed and later Milton Friedman talked about nobody knowing how to make a pencil, and of course nobody knows how to make that uh, computer mouse. Literally nobody. Um, the knowledge is stored uh, among many different people. Uh, and therefore, the fact that a human being hasn't got a big enough brain to think about how to make a computer mouse um, uh, doesn't matter, because the knowledge can be, can be stored in society. Now, um, there's a lesson from biology here, which is that <clears throat> sexual reproduction had an enormous impact on um, the rate of biological evolution, because it essentially made evolution cumulative. Um, if, you, if you hadn't invented sex, then if you invent two different things, uh, if you have two different mutations in, in the species, they're going to be in competition with each other. One is going to drive the other extinct. So imagine an early mammal that invents the placenta, and that helps it be competitively superior, and another mammal that invents milk, say, and uh, that's not quite such a good invention, and so it has to go extinct. Um, uh, whereas if the species is sexual, then the two inventions can come together and join the same team. The mutations can actually end up uh, within the same organisms. And it's exactly the same with trade. Um, once you start exchanging objects, you no longer have to decide whether or not the technology tribe A has invented is superior to the technology tribe B has invented. You can get the best of both worlds, or coalition government as we call it in Britain. <laughs> and surely this process must be happening extraordinarily more rapidly now um, than ever uh, because of the ability for ideas to come together and, as it were, have sex um, on the internet. Because um, <laughs> um, that's sort of what's happening. Um, uh, ideas are combining uh, and uh, recombining all the time. And whereas it took uh, you know, several hundred years for the idea of gunpowder and the idea of steel cannons to get together, um, now it takes about a couple of minutes for uh, things on different sides of the globe to get together and, and, and mate. So, just to end on a, a positive note, um, uh, and taking my cue from Indo Goklani here, um, 
I think one of the things that we've got to try and get across, or I want to try and get across to people, is that if this process of exchange and specialization continues, and as a result, innovation, and as, as a result, rising living standards, then we can really raise our sights. We don't have to say, I want to stop the world getting worse. I actually want us to see if there are extraordinary things that we haven't even imagined we can do yet to make the world better. And here's just a simple and rather low-tech example. We've approximately trebled um, the yield of cereal um, from our agricultural land over 50 years. Um, and as Indo has pointed out, um, this has come at the expense of plowing no more land. We've got three times as much food out of the same amount of land. And if that hadn't happened, um, then an extra area the size of South America would have had to be plowed to feed the modern population. And if we run that tape forward, as population growth slows, which it will, then how not only can we plow no more land, but we can start plowing less and less land. Um, how much land do we need to feed each person? Um, well, uh, hunter-gatherers need about three central parks per head uh, to support themselves. Uh, slash and burn farmers, about 10 hectares. It, by the 1950s, we were feeding people off roughly 4,000 square meters each, and now we're down to about 1,200 square meters each. That, by the way, is quite a strong riposte to the environmental argument that the human footprint is always increasing. I don't think it is. The human impact is in lots of ways, this is only one of them, um, getting better. Currently, we crop about 15 million square kilometers of land, which is roughly the size of Russia. If we were trying to feed the same number of people from, uh, with the technology of early farmers, we'd obviously struggle. We'd need far too much land, and there isn't enough land available. Um, uh, if we were trying to feed them with the 1950s yield, we'd still need an awful lot more land. Um, and with today's yields, to feed 9 billion people, we would need more land than we currently plow. But if yields were to double, we would actually feed 9 billion people in 2050 with a smaller acreage than we are today. So, in, so when people say, if we don't improve agriculture, we can't feed 9 billion people, it's more than that. If we improve agriculture, we can feed 9 billion people and give a huge amount of land back to nature. In theory, we could feed the world from a much smaller acreage still. The maximum practical yield that is achieved by farmers means that, in theory, you can feed 9 billion people from an area the size of Nigeria. Because, of course, as I say, the world population uh, increase has, has halved in my lifetime. So. Um, I really want to end by emphasizing that the invention of this extraordinary ability to truck barter and exchange, to quote Adam Smith, um, has been absolutely central to the human, the takeoff of human beings. It's not a story of imagination or language or, or big brains or all these kind of things. It's, it's a, a simple and rather mundane story that this, this process of learning to exchange and specialize is what transformed our species. Um, and of course, as Brink said, it's all no good um, because I'm a fool. Um, as John Stuart Mill said a long time ago, uh, I have observed that not the man who hopes when others despair, but the man who despairs when others hope is admired by a large class of persons as a sage. Thank you very much. And of course, John Stuart Mill thought that material progress was going to be petering out relatively soon and we were going to enter the steady state of eternal stagnation. Uh, commenting uh, today uh, is uh, Robin Hanson, uh, one of the most interesting and provocative minds I've had the pleasure of being exposed to. Uh, Robin is uh, associate professor of economics at George Mason University. Uh, he's also a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford and uh, a chief scientist at Consensus Point. How he got to economics is an interesting story uh, because he uh, originally, uh, back in 1984, got a master's in physics and a master's in philosophy of science from uh, University of Chicago and spent the next uh, several years researching artificial intelligence. Uh, but then uh, <clears throat> decided to switch careers and got his PhD from Caltech uh, in 1997. 
and since then has been widely published in uh, a kind of mind-numbingly broad array of fields. Uh, his, uh, his bio says his uh, research interests are diverse, uh, I'll say. Uh, just ending on uh, the topics, uh, the last few of the paper topics that he's written about recently include uh, the origin of life, the survival of humanity, very long-term economic growth, growth given machine intelligence, and interstellar colonization. Uh, <clears throat> Robin uh, uh, goes way out beyond where most people uh, are, are thinking uh, because he takes the lessons uh, of Matt Ridley's books and runs with them. In particular, he takes seriously uh, the notion of exponential growth and what that might mean if we project outward into the future. Uh, and the things he has to say uh, seem so cockeyed optimistic uh, that they make uh, Matt Ridley look like Eeyore by comparison. Uh, <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome for Robin Hanson. Apparently, a good modern intellectual book must be of the sandwich sort that he alluded to. There needs to be a, a basic idea that's about a paragraph long you could explain to your friends. And this basic idea has to have both a normative component, it lets you take a position and be on some side of a controversy, and it needs to have a positive component, it needs to have an intellectual contribution that makes a claim that's, that you can defend with facts and that sort of thing. In addition to having these two parts of the bread of the sandwich, uh, a modern successful intellectual book needs to have 300 pages of stuff in between. And that stuff in between can't uh, depend, the, the main argument of the book can't have to depend on all those details because that would become a complicated intellectual book that you'd have to read through carefully and to understand and you'd quickly get lost. So all that detail needs to be relevant for the main point, but it can't be necessary for the main point. You, you need to be able to get the argument without following all that detail, but you need to think the details relevant. I'm really impressed with Matt filling this book with 400 pages of fascinating, uh, very broad, I mean, he's broader than I am in terms of topics, very broad range of subjects. I learned an incredible amount reading all that detail in the book. I learned about acid rain not being a problem, about totalitarian Ming Dynasty. I learned about fantastic things going on in Botswana, uh, the noble Phoenicians. Uh, less climate variability when things are warmer. I just learned an incredible range of interesting stuff, but of course, that doesn't make a good discussion here. <laughs> I should address the bread part of the sandwich, the outside, the, the main thing that's the uh, topic of the book. Now, I turns out I agree pretty strongly with the main thesis of the book, so I'm gonna have to stretch pretty far to find something to agree, disagree with, though apparently that is the contract for the commenters like that. You're supposed to find something to disagree with, so I, I will achieve that. But <laughs> it's a contract, you know. <laughs> the, uh, the key idea that uh, humans, sometime in the last few hundred thousand years ago, developed a way to specialize outside of families and to then to trade their specialties to achieve larger gains, and that this mechanism of trade allowed for innovation across whatever scale there was trade, and the rate of innovation was scaled with the rate, the, the scale of that trading is a key powerful idea. I think it's absolutely right. I don't really know how many people disagree with that. If there's a lot, they're wrong. <laughs> it's uh, right. Um, basically, uh, that is uh, a powerful main reason why we'd be getting richer, why we'd be getting powerful, is this vast increase in uh, our abilities through innovation that's uh, channeled from trade and specialization. Uh, that's not only why we're rich now, it sets this grand story of what makes humans unique, and people like grand stories about what makes us unique, and we're more willing to support whatever it is that makes us unique. And if you tell us that fingers made us unique, then we think fingers were great. So this is a way to make people think trade is great, I guess, because it's whatever it is that makes us unique. And we know, regardless of what it is that makes us unique, that's a great thing, because we're great, right? So there we go. <laughs> now. Um, There's the issue of the connection between this thesis of the cause of our being rich and optimism, uh, optimism for the future. Now, the, the strongest case is that uh, 
Innovation will continue. That is, uh, if you've got this huge space of ideas that keep combining and that keep developing good things, then uh, that should continue for a long time. And so for a very long time, we ought to see continued uh, development of our capabilities. Our descendants, whatever they are, ought to continue to have a very uh, increasing, powerful range of capabilities. So I've agreed with that, too. So what do I have left to disagree with? <laughs> uh, I'll take my stand on uh, two kinds of points. One is, and this takes a long view to really take seriously, it can't go on forever. Forever is a really, really long time. You go back a million years, and maybe you see a pattern for a million years, and maybe you're willing to project that out. I'm happy to project that out 100, 1,000, maybe a million years into the future. But the stars around here should be productive for another 10 trillion years, and forever is a lot longer than that. So the claim that this will go on forever, that there are no limits whatsoever from innovation and growth, even I, even I, find that a little hard, a bit much to swallow. So uh, optimism, eventually there'll be a dark cloud out there. Eventually it can't go on the way it is, and I'll elaborate that. But I'm still say yes, optimism for the foreseeable future, for sure. Uh, we've got a long, long, grand way to go. The other point on which I want to disagree is the issue of individual optimism related to global optimism or, or the species optimism. So innovation assures us that for a long time at least, the total capacity of all of us together will increase as long as that engine of innovation isn't shut off entirely, it's just to continue to grow. Uh, what, whether that means individuals, you, your grandchildren, your great-great-great-grandchildren will, should be optimistic, depends on the relationship between our total capacity and individual capacity, and particularly between the number of individuals. So um, over this grand time period, I think, uh, I think Matt somewhat downplayed the standard story, which I think is basically right, that in the transition from hunter-gathering to farming, uh, individual wealth, individual freedom, individual range of, of life and things like that went down. That's uh, nutrition was restrained. Slavery introduced, vast amount more war, uh, marriage uh, in terms of more constrained relationships between the genders. Uh, those all appeared with farming. And the standard story is that was worse. And that's perfectly consistent with the grand increase in innovation, because there were far more of them, of course. Uh, but the per capita wealth is a you know relative to the amount of wealth and the number of people. And uh, that was in an area where the number of people could grow very rapidly. And so uh, the per capita wealth depended on details like the kind of life they lived, whether there were kings and others stealing stuff, et cetera. And honestly, it looked like that was not such a great thing for the individuals. But if you think about, if you think there being more individuals is good, what, like I do, if you think it's better that there were hundreds of times more people living valuable lives, then you still might think that overall this was a good thing, even if individuals uh, didn't do so well in terms of their individual lives weren't as good. We, um, and it, he, in the book, he does talk about how dictators can uh, make things go bad, and if uh, there's enough of a totalitarian rule that uh, their lives might not be as good because of that, and that is a real risk in the future, and he, and he grants that. Um, now, there's a quote here I wanted to give. He says, why are we not spending large sums stockpiling food caches in cities so that people can survive the risks from North Korean missiles, rogue robots, alien invaders, nuclear wars, pandemics, and super volcanoes? The topic here is, uh, are there ways we could destroy ourselves all, and uh, how seriously should we take that? And I agree that the risk is low in the sense that the most likely outcome is that we will do well, and we will uh, continue to grow. But if there's any small chance that we will not do that, those small chances are really important. And they're really worth reducing any way we can. Not that we should just do random things because people say there's a problem. But um, it's like, as the richer we are, the more we take care of our children and the more protective we are of our children. Because we know they have a long future ahead of them. And if a small thing were to destroy their life, that would be all the more of a loss. And we, this junior species, with a great fast future in front of us, all of that could be lost 
if somehow we destroyed ourselves. So a true existential risk is clearly something we should put substantial effort in. So I would say, yes, we should actually spend substantial sums to do exactly this. Uh, if that would substantially reduce the chances that uh, something that would actually destroy us all. That's a way in which um, optimism for the future leads you to pay attention to scenarios that aren't optimistic and try to do as much as you can about them. Uh, elsewhere, uh, he says, the wonderful thing about knowledge is that it is genuinely limitless. There is not even a theoretical possibility of exhausting the supply of ideas, discoveries, and inventions. Well, in some literal sense, there's an infinite set of possible software you could write, things like that. But in terms of useful innovations, uh, I expect that eventually there'll be diminishing returns. Eventually, when a million or trillion years in the future, when we've searched vast spaces of possible software designs or other ways of arranging atoms, we'll mostly be pretty close to the best ways of doing things. It'll be very low rate at which we improve that, and we will, for the most part, have reached the frontiers of knowledge and what's possible. That's a long, glorious future away, no doubt. That's nothing like problems we should worry about now, but I mean, come on. I have a physics background. <laughs> if physics is the way we think it is, and if people's values are the way they are now, I mean, uh, physics could be different. It could be that, you know, infinite possibilities exponentially growing are possible. That's always logically possible, but it's just not the way that physics seems now. Or it could be that we create creatures who get infinite value out of these subtle ways of rearranging atoms, in which case they can have infinite value increasing. But that's not what we are. That's not what humans are like. So uh, I tend to think this is the dream time. This era in these few thousand, few hundred, even few million years, in all of human history, in all of the history of the universe, this is the great era where we grew, where we discovered, where we spread out, where we uh, innovated, where we expanded into the space of all things you can think about and understand. And a million or so years in the future, we will begin the long, slow trillions of years where we basically got most of that. And if, if we're lucky, trillions or trillions of trillions of descendants will go on living happy lives in a more steady, stable world with a lot less innovation and perhaps a lot less per capita wealth. So the other thing to be cautious about the future is to say, recently, wealth per capita wealth has been increasing because this rate of innovation is so fast, so powerful, that uh, it's just outstripped the ability to make more people. And that's why per capita wealth is, has increased. Obviously, in the past, we had powerful, important innovation that over millions of years went a long way. But because we could make people faster than that, per capita wealth was limited. Uh, in the distant future, uh, I think per capita wealth, again, has to be limited in the sense that uh, the rate at which we could increase the population will just have to be larger than the rate at which we could increase the economic base in the sense of uh, through innovation. And that it will become a choice then uh, how how we trade off the number of our descendants versus their per capita wealth. And I don't necessarily see an economic externality there, a reason for regulation. Each clan will choose for itself how to make that trade off, whether to have many descendants who are each relatively poor or to have a few descendants who are each relatively rich. But uh, obviously, numerically, the numbers will be dominated by the people who make the second choice. So that I expect that in the very distant future, most of our descendants will be relatively poor out of their choice. They think that's the better way to go. But uh, whether you think that's an optimistic outcome or not, of course, depends on whether you defer to their choices and accept that if they want it that way, that's OK with you. Uh, I, it's OK with me, so I'm optimistic about that. But uh, I don't want to tie the concept of optimism to visions of increasing per capita wealth forever. Uh, it could be that if our descendants prefer it, lower per capita wealth will be the better future for them. Uh, but anyway, overall, great sandwich. <laughs> Lots of tasty meat and vegetables inside the sandwich, all sorts of great details I learned a lot from. Uh, powerful idea on the outside of the basically right. If people really disagree, they're wrong. He's right. Uh, the future does, at least for a long time, have great optimism to, in store. We've got a lot of things we can do. We mostly can do it well and pay attention to the problems. Uh, the key intellectual insight that the, Humanity's rise is primarily due to specialization and trade and the innovation that comes with that, basically right as well. 
And if they disagree with that, they're wrong as well. So hats off. I imagine in the many events you do, uh, hence, uh, the book was just published, uh, was it this week, right? It was just the official release. So you're at the very front end of, uh, of uh, the barnstorming book promotion tour. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, the comments you receive are, are, uh, are just going to be very different from Robin's, by and large. <laughs> you're going to get blasted for your opinions on global warming or acid rain and, uh, or your touting of the glories of promiscuous sex, uh, amongst ideas. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but being chided for not having thought through uh, things a million years hence is, uh, is probably, uh, uh, you've probably got your dose of it just now. And, I'll, take uh, it. I'll take his trillion years. That's, yeah. that's good enough yeah. for me. <clears throat> um, I saw you scribbling things down as Robin was writing. Do you want a couple of minutes to react to what he said before I open up the... Uh... I, would, I would love that, actually. Okay. Brink, if, 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 if it's not, I, I'll try not to take too much time. Just, just two or three small points. First, that um, uh, Robin made the point, who disagrees with the basic theory? Well, actually, uh, in terms of the sort of archaeology and anthropology, I think there are still a lot of people who don't reckon that trade is of any significance at all in the story of humanity. And, and I do think that that's a, a, a one, one we can, can go on getting, getting, um, getting right. Um, uh, I completely agree with you about forever, and, and I, I may have overstated in a few places. Um, in fact, my focus is really on the next 100 years and trying to persuade people that that isn't going to be a terrible time, because certainly living in Europe, you know, nobody thinks their grandchildren's life is going to be better than theirs. I, I just find that bizarre. Um, and I do think that the, the you know, the, when you look at that exponential graph and you say that can't go on forever, yes, I agree. but. W once we enter a declining population, you can imagine wealth going on forever without um, the impact on the planet going on forever um, upwards. Uh, you know, and that's the thing that changes halfway through this century. Um, um, uh, and I take your point, Robin, about you know, not under not not implying that everything's always going upward, and that in terms of individual lives, the invention of farming brought disadvantages. And in particular, I do make a lot of play of what I call chiefs, priests, and thieves who throw this process off course by uh, plundering um, the product of it, as it were. And one thing on there that I, I would love to hear your reaction to and, and others is uh, the, the concern which has been crystallizing in my mind just really in the last few days, which is that, um, although I think I do mention it right at the end of the book, which is that um, because of globalization, ideas can spread around the world and that means bad ideas can spread around the world quicker too and just possibly we are now in a position where if someone tried to do a sort of Ming Emperor job and shut down trade and population movements etc they could now do it on behalf of the whole planet rather than just one empire um, is that a reason for to be really quite worried or not I, I don't know um, just on limitless knowledge um, I, I'm not sure you physicists are right about this because um, if, uh, if I mean, I'm going back to the Stephen Pinker's old thing that if, you, if somebody says he's found the longest sentence in the world, you know he's wrong because you can always rewrite it with the words he said in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's the sort of limitlessness I, I think I'm talking about. But it, is that a help just to start this discussion off? Sure. Oh, well, let's uh, open up the floor to questions. Uh, when I uh, call on you, uh, a mic will come. Uh, just identify yourself and uh, make your question a question. Uh, right up here in front, Swami. Swami Iyer of the Cato Institute and an old colleague of Matt's at The Economist. Uh, Matt, so if everything is going to get better, are we terribly wrong in constantly worrying that high entitlements and fiscal deficits are going to make it difficult for guys ahead to pay. So do we just go ahead and run all kinds of fiscal deficit and entitlement saying, you know, Matt says things are going to get better. We shouldn't really worry about this. Uh, the second thing that strikes me, I mean, you have Nisim Taleb, saying that at the end of it all, we can make all the rational analyses of what's going to go right or wrong. But the thing that always hits you and makes a nonsense of you is the black swan, the thing that you never considered and couldn't have considered. So 
The other thing is, in other words, even if we are extremely optimistic on the fiscal side, will we get slaughtered by a black swan? Very good. And uh, I mean, on, on the entitlements point, uh, I think it's simply a matter of scale. In other words, there is nothing wrong with running a Ponzi scheme if humanity is getting richer and richer, because the debts you take out now can be repaid by yourself in the future, um, particularly if you spend that money on innovation that will make the future richer, make your future self richer. But <laughs> it depends how Ponzi your scheme is. I mean, how much, your, uh, how much debt you're running up. And I think there's absolutely no doubt that we in the UK and, and the US have collectively, uh, we're not sort of going for um, public sector, private sector distinctions at this point, um, overdone it and borrowed too much from the future, from our future selves. Um, luckily, somewhere in the world, someone hasn't, and that's the Chinese and the Indians, I would guess. Um, so, uh, yeah, in the next 20 years, I expect, certainly my country, and maybe this country, to have a rocky couple of decades, possibly Japanese, possibly even Argentinian. But the world will continue inexorably. And what, what, I mean, I'm so struck by the way, if you look at that graph of per capita GDP um, globally, you can't really even see the recessions. You can sort of see little kinks in the curve, but um, the, the bigger the picture, the more it irons out. So that's, that's one point. The second point was the black swan. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, th there's, there's sort of the black swans we can do nothing about, like the volcanoes, uh, mega volcanoes and the asteroids, that, which are genuine existential risks. And um, some of them we can stockpile mm -hmm. caches of food for, but some of them I suspect that wouldn't help. Um, uh, and I think there are undoubtedly black swans that we cause ourselves that, that are going to come along, you know, or, or, or you know, that, that are, that are going to, hit us in all sorts of ways. I would just point out that there's been a hell of a lot of people over the last couple of hundred years saying, look, there's a black swan, acid rain, um, cancer epidemics from chemicals, eugenic decline, you know, all these kind of things. And they didn't turn out to be that black. They were sort of gray swans. <laughs> um, that's one answer, anyway. And just the point that things are going to get better isn't assuming that we just all sit back and relax. It's assuming people continue to stress out and work hard and solve problems and be ingenious. And so it's an overwhelming likelihood that your children are going to grow up to healthy adulthood, but only because you're constantly chasing after them, keeping them from sticking their tongues in the light socket and all the other crazy things the kids do. Um, right here. Hi, um, is this on? It's now. A uh, question. Um, as the world, because of trade, we're getting more and more connected. And we started out when I was born, um, where you had local influence. And if you know, there was a local you know, food shortage or something, you, you suffered, but you could get it from somewhere else. Do you have any thoughts about the hyper-connectedness that we're not even at yet, but we will be in 10, 20 years, where everything's connected to everything, and uh, you, you won't have many failures, but when you have, have a failure, it'll affect everyone? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's, in Britain, we sometimes justify our sort of agricultural policies, sort of protective agricultural policies or the need for, you know, homegrown food on the grounds that, um, you know, what if the U-boats come back? Um, <laughs> which, uh, which, which is sort of, uh, and, and my answer to that is, well, if the U-boats come back, we're in deep trouble anyway because we don't make any combine harvesters in this country. So, so uh, we can't, you know, we're, 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 we're utterly um, in, in trouble there. Um, in terms of whether hyperconnectedness makes you, you vulnerable, I mean, obviously, if we get to the point where all the shoes are made in one factory in Vietnam and all the laptops are made in one factory in, in Taiwan and something happens, you know, there's a revolution in Vietnam or Taiwan and so nobody can buy shoes, um, then, yeah, that, that would be a, a vulnerability. Uh, I don't quite see it ever going that far because that's, uh, you know, your immediate, the, the monopolies are vulnerable in, to um, free riders, and I'm not, no, to the, to the opposite of free riders. And, and um, so I, I, I sort of feel that it'll never, that the concentration of dependence on 
particular places will never get to that worrying point. And meanwhile, if you know, if there was a famine in France in the 1690s, which there was, a lot of people died because, um, and a lot of people moved because it was cheaper to move people than food. Interestingly, in the 1690s, because people could move themselves, food couldn't. So you got these mass movements in France in, during those famines in the 1690s, and a lot of people died. Um, now, Australia can have a complete failure of its wheat harvest, and nobody goes hungry. There's a bit of a price spike um, in Chicago or something, but that's a pretty small price to pay. So um, I'm, I'm finding it hard to see a black side to interconnectedness, but there may be a few. You're right. Robin, any time you feel like chiming in, feel free to do so. Well, actually, on that one, having um, more disaster contingent prices is uh, the right economist thing to do about uh, so, for example, uh, electric companies, uh, you know, are regulated and they get paid a certain amount of for delivering electricity. But that price isn't contingent on there being a disaster. So, in fact, they don't have a lot of profit incentive to uh, set themselves up to deliver electricity in a disaster. They have regulatory constraints. But, uh, right. uh, Andre. Larian of Gate Institute. Um, I didn't read your book, so just I apologize. Maybe you covered these issues already there. Uh, but I have a feeling that um, you devote mostly your attention to the uh, progress, the one aspect of the progress, sustainability of the progress, and the role the trade and the exchange plays in sustainability of the progress. If you can comment on three other very related issues to, uh, to this. One is initiation of the progress. Uh, even when you're talking about Neanderthal society, this um, some kind of invention of cooking food or language or down the road, law or property, whatever, it was done not due to trade, but due to something else. So what is the some kind of the beginning of the progress? Second issue, how to stop the progress? Uh, one way is just to stop exchange and trade, as it was in the Wistosmania society and the Ming din dynasty. But it's not only. A uh, number of civilizations and societies stopped to develop and to, to have a progress even trading, including, for example, a number of Middle Eastern societies uh, in uh, Middle Ages. At least in relative, it was a relative decline very clearly. Uh, and some civilizations actually became extinct, even some kind of having some relative trade. So what could be an explanation to that? And the third issue is relative speed in progress. Uh, we have at least uh, over the last much shorter period, maybe decades, so it's comp incomparable with uh, time horizon that you are dealing with, but number of authoritarian societies that are trading and exchanging actively looks like, in terms of material progress, are developing faster than more democratic societies. So what kind of challenge it poses for the Syria and for the progress? Yeah. Great questions. Thank you. Um, just quickly on all three, and again, Robin, jump in on this if you want. Um, uh, on initiation of, of progress, um, uh, my argument would be that things like cooking and language um, and indeed making stone tools um, are initiated by gene culture coevolution. Now, that's a mouthful of a phrase, but what it means is that essentially you start, uh, individuals start doing something which then puts pressure on their genes to respond to, to produce a genetic adaptation to help them do that. So for the, the classic example of this is milk drinking um, was probably started before we were lactose tolerant, because you can see that lactose tolerance genes evolve in people who had taken up dairying as a, as a way of, so, so that, that kind of progress um, has been happening in our species for millions of years, and it's, it's limited by the speed of genetic change. And, and if you look at what happens to uh, hominids between one and a half million years ago and half a million years ago, their genes change faster than their technologies. That's a baffling thought, but it's true. Um, that those hand axes don't change shape, but the skulls do. Um, and that all changes 100,000 years ago, when suddenly without, I mean, there's been 
trivial quantities of genetic change uh, in human beings since 100,000 years ago, but there's been spectacular quantities of, of uh, um, uh, cultural change. Now, that, for me, the, that's the initiation that I'm interested in. And I think the key hurdle, the, the difficult bit, the bit the Neanderthals never got across and the chimpanzees never got across, is the ability to do something collaborative with a stranger. Um, until, I mean, if you, if you ask chimpanzees from two different troops to, to board an airplane together, they'd kill each other in the aisle. Um, and we were the same, I'm sure. And at some point we had to, you know, we, we might have been doing a lot of exchanging and specializing within the tribe, but how the heck you ever thought, um, I know, I'll offer them fruit if they offer me fish. Uh, it's, it's almost unimaginable how we got across that barrier, but we did at some point. Um, so that's an initiation point that I think is interesting. Um, how to stop progress. Um, I would like you to produce some evidence of that societies declined while still trading vigorously. Which date? Well, hang on. Genghis Khan had a hu was a was a, a lubricator of trade because he he knocked out uh, a lot of barriers to trade, which were basically toll booths that were operated along the Silk Route by princelings. So he he helped trade. Um, yeah. Anyway, we can get into details here, but but my, my impression is that that I can't really find convincing examples of societies that kept trading well without piracy preventing it or dictators preventing it and saw falling living, living standards. But we can maybe talk about that afterwards. Um, the final point about relative speed of, of, of change in different parts of the world uh, and this phenomenon of um, free market authoritarian governments or what, I, I mean, I imagine you're referring to Singapore or China or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't really know enough about that, and I think um, uh, my, my answer would be if you pull back the lens far enough and look with big enough perspective uh, over a long enough period of time, that doesn't work, <laughs> um, that something has to give, um, either on the political or on the economic side, um, but that, yes, for short periods, authoritarian regimes can push through... Um, well, no, there's a funny uh, there's a funny thing about China, which I don't not a subject I know well, um, which is that in a funny way, if if you've got a very authoritarian regime, uh, if it sort of stops working very well at the local level, then you're almost freer <laughs> than if you're if you're 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 almost freer to get on with your life um, once the once the local official is not being told to to come down and interfere with you. Um, do you see what I mean? I don't know. Anyway, those are just a few thoughts. Jason. Jason Kuznicki, Cato Institute. Uh, you seem to be optimistic about two things that are potentially in conflict with each other. I want to ask you about that. Uh, the first thing you're optimistic about is specialization of labor, gains from trade. Uh, I think that's pretty uncontroversial. Uh, Yes, I'm optimistic about that, too. The second thing you're optimistic about, though, is declining population. You've said it several times. Uh, a decline in population, however, is going to uh, mean a declining upper limit on what you can get out of specialization and trade, as, as I think you yourself have, have noted. Uh, and there will be a, a corresponding reduction in our capacity to, uh, to keep knowledge culturally. Uh, so what gives there? Uh, how can you be optimistic about both? Very good point. And, and um, I, I guess what you're saying is that are we going to experience a Tasmanian phenomenon on behalf of the planet once we drop from 9 billion to 8 billion? Um, uh, one answer is that's quite a long way off still. We've still got another 50 years of increasing numbers. Uh, another answer is that I suspect that, that, that we haven't anything like bottomed out the quantity of exchange and specialization we can do among 6 billion, let alone 9 billion. Um, yet, and therefore, you know, there's a lot of slack in that system. I thought you were going to go on to say, surely declining populations are a bad idea because of um, 
the number of elderly people who have to be supported by working age populations and that sort of thing, and the, and the degree to which elderly people are less interested in innovation than young people, and so that might might, um, and I think that is an issue. But my main feeling is just what an incredible stroke of luck it is that the demographic transition exists. In other words, had we had we had this huge increase in wealth in the 19th and 20th centuries, and it had translated into more babies, um, as you know, Robin al uh, uh, alluded to, um, uh, then and you know, then all the doomsayers about population in the 60s would be right. You know, this can't go on. You know, we'd be now we'd we'd now be at nine billion, and we'd be talking about 12 billion in 20, in 15 years' time. You know, um, the extraordinary phenomenon whereby when people get rich enough. They start to have fewer kids rather than more. Um, I still think it's a bit of a stroke of luck. I mean, you can come up with explanations. I'd try to in, in, in the book. Um, uh, you know, it's all about being able to essentially put effort into quality of children rather than quantity, and you don't have to worry about them dying and things like that. Um, and it's to do with urbanization and female education and all these kind of things. But it it's uh, I, I'm optimistic in a backward-looking sense about this. Thank God that happened. You're right, it's not a completely free win. There are going to be issues to do with it that we need to think about. But I think the running out of innovative capacity in a population of 9 billion is one that I'll, I'll throw into Robin's million-year problem rather than uh, anything imminent. So, like Matt says, the demographic transition is not something we fully understand, and it, we're perhaps lucky that it happened. I, I think... Uh, expecting it to continue on a, say, a thousand-year time scale is way too optimistic. Uh, you know, we've seen species for billions of years uh, consistently <laughs> increase their populations until they ran up against capacity limits. And I ex we have a very clear intellectual argument why that should happen. And, you know, there are subpopulations in our world that have much higher fertility. So over a longer time scale, we're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, the Amish and the Mormons are going to take over, you mean? Yeah. 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 So, <clears throat> just uh, to follow up on this question and get somewhere in between the time frame that you focused on the next hundred years and, and Robin's time frame, but maybe maybe actually within your time frame, what happens to your sunny picture of population stabilization if all this wonderful specialization and exchange churns up radical life extension? Uh, right now, uh, <clears throat> people in rich countries can't be bothered to have much more than 2.1 children. and, and, and Many societies are having much trouble getting to that uh, because uh, it's a big expenditure of time and energy over a good chunk of your healthy adult lifetime. Uh, but if that child-rearing period becomes a relatively trivial part of your lifetime, aren't you going to be expected to have more than 2.1 kids because you'll do it again and again? Uh, and so won't fertility rates go up and then you get your population explosion all over again? I think, no. I think what will happen is if you know you're going to live to 150 and you can have kids when you're 110, then you'll postpone the decision to have babies. Um, all the evidence is that, you, that we rich Westerners postpone the decision as long as we damn well can. And uh, so I suspect the birth rate will plummet if, if we get radical life extension. But Probably. who knows? For most. <laughs> For some. Uh, Bill. Yeah, right here. Then, then you next. Bill and Scannon, among other things, increased trade will reduce the price of killing other people, reduce the price of, uh, of in, uh, involving yourself in their life, controlling their life, uh, reduce the price of maybe ultimately reading their mind. Now, how is it that, uh, how is it that we're going to protect ourselves against that? This is, this is from somebody who thinks that, that, uh, that the past 65 years we have, we have just been pure, dumb, lucky to have avoided nuclear war. Um, it's a very good point, and, uh, I, I, and I personally don't think we were just lucky. I think you know there was a there was a degree of uh, deterrence in nuclear weapons that 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 actually helped prevent wars. But just, I mean, this may not be quite the best way of addressing your questions, but it's, it's, it's just a, a, a reaction. Um, I got a computer virus on my laptop earlier this week and um, went into a sort of tailspin of panic. Um, and 
called my wife who knows about these things much better than I do and and she went on a website where it was immediately possible to find the solution to this problem um, and there was a sort of crowdsourced forum of people saying yes but the virus designer has got around the problem um, uh, so you need to do this extra additional patch to, to sort it etc and within a couple of hours it was all sorted now my point there is that the the good guys can have an open forum anywhere on the net in which we, and they can and they can draw on crowdsourcing to solve this problem. The bad guys can't do that. They've got to, uh, you know, if if you if 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 they started a website that anyone could contribute to about how to improve the computer virus so that it attacks people better, um, uh, we'd be able to get at it. Now. That's a very specific. It doesn't answer any of your questions, but it 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 just gives me a, a feeling that there's a general point here, which is that um, uh, yes, um, bad motives are going to enjoy the globalization as well as good ones, but I think there's a slight asymmetry that good ones are going to benefit more than bad ones. Um, I'd have to think it through to answer some of your specific points, but um, uh, you know the, the the groundswell of uh, fury at Google for straying from the path of uh, open freedom uh, or Wikipedia or whatever is is strong enough to prevent us slipping down the slippery slope towards mass mind reading, perhaps. Gentlemen. My name's Andrew Kenny. Question for Dr. Ridley. I agreed with every word you, every word you said, and I think there's no doubt that uh, for the world things are getting better and better. But there's certain parts where there's no doubt that things are getting worse and worse. And in those parts, the people responsible for making things getting worse and worse are always famous and often regarded as heroic. So I come from South Africa, north of the border Zimbabwe. Robert Mugabe in 30 years has systematically wrecked the Zimbabwean economy. He's reduced life expectancy from about 55 years to 35. He's made life far worse in every single measure for the people of Zimbabwe. And he's regarded, he's world famous, and is regarded as an all African hero. The ANC, the ruling government, just almost worships him. Um, same thing in, Cast uh, in, in Cuba. Fidel Castro has wrecked the economy and regarded as a hero around the world. Same thing as Lenin in, 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 in Russia. The, peop the, the people who make things better are boring and forgotten. People who make things worse become conquering heroes. Comment on that. I, I think that's a very important insight. And, and my, my answer is, um, and I, I'm very influenced by Deirdre McCloskey on this, because I, I think um, we, we still have... In, in us a tendency to worship courage and honor and ver uh, not honor courage and 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 uh, you know power and things like that which which is a sort of leftover of our sort of ape man past it's long before this stuff it's it's all about um, how you know it, it's deep in human nature it goes back millions of years that you know you ally yourselves to power um, it to the alpha male in the troop if you like um, and it's a total irrelevance and a distraction and a mistake in uh, the modern world where prudence, as she puts it, or you know, economic activity is, is, is what should be heroic, and it isn't. And the contempt for um, uh, traders that runs through the whole of history, not just sort of Victorian English, but right back to Homer and people like that, who's snotty about the Phoenicians. Um, uh, you know, it, it is is an extraordinary phenomenon, and and yet we're still doing it to our kids. You know, in my we and, and I do it myself. You know, I mean, I go and go to movies about Napoleon and um, you know who was clearly a most dreadful uh, chap. Uh, you know, rather than movies about um, merchants, which <laughs> wouldn't sell very well. <laughs> uh, right up there. Gentleman in the brown shirt. Uh, I just wanted to to make a point that. Um, well, first of all, I loved your talk. I thought it was great. And I'm a biologist, not an economist. So, um, but so I wanted to make two points. Really, one is that um, you made a point of tracing trade back as far as you can, and yet the inflection point 
in the economy, economic growth as a century ago, just merely to suggest that trade per se wasn't the, the cause of the inflection point, but something, an emergent property of the scale of trade. And, and then to sort of, as a biologist, ask you, if you were to take economics out of the picture and look back, not a trillion years, but a, you know, increase the scale by a thousand years or a thousandfold and go back 4.5 billion years ago and trace the evolution of the diversity of life on Earth and think about commerce now as the commerce in energy or something like that, that you can actually see a metaphor in the evolution of life that actually parallels many of these things with halts and, and, and some regression when there were things like asteroids and, and other sort of major perturbations to the system. So those two comments. Yeah, on, on the second point first, I, I, I do agree with you. I think, I think uh, and I think biology is coming around to the view that if, uh, that if you look at the progression of life, you do see, quotes, progress. In other words, as it were, more of the sunlight falling on Earth is being captured by organisms or something like that, or there's, there's, there are more species or something. And then you get these terrific setbacks when an asteroid hits the Earth at the end of the Permian or the end of the Cretaceous or whatever, and then it starts again. And so... Yeah, the annex, you know, in the there's a there's a long period when there's plenty of life in the sea, but there's nothing much going on on land. You know, now we've got a lot going on on land. Eventually, uh, something else. You know, there'll be more, more there'll be I don't know plants flying through the air or something like that. Um, uh, uh, on your first point about the inflection point uh, in in human progress, um, yes, I mean in all exponential things. Uh, the further back you go, the slower things are, as it were. And uh, I admit that the first um, 80,000 years um, after the invention of trade, not a lot happens. What does happen is you get, you get flourishings of new technologies, and then they disappear again. And that's probably a population density point, back to what we were talking about earlier, that these, uh, f for whatever reason, you get a sort of Tasmanian effect. This is all in Africa. Uh, and then it comes out of Africa, and around 45,000 years ago, you get the Upper Paleolithic Revolution, which is a, like the Industrial Revolution, except played out much, much more slowly. Um, and then you get the 10,000-year Neolithic Revolution, which is farming, which is when we can really increase our population density, and that ramps up the rate of innovation. And then the 1800 one is, to me, all about fossil fuels um, because of the amplification of each person's work. Um, and it's no accident that... that that you know, that's really when you start using steam and coal and, and so on. Um, uh, so, but I, I mean, Robin's the expert on these inflection points, so I'll pass it over to him. Well, I actually disagree with Matt in terms of the causes of these main inflection points, uh, but the overall story we agree with, which is that it's about the scale of the interaction in trade. And so it's plausible that even though trade started out, uh, you know, 100,000 years ago that it's remained within small scale of 100 or 200 miles, and that was the growth rate was limited by that small scale of the trade they had, and that at some point uh, these smaller trading regions intersected and overlapped to create long-distance trade, and then that would have greatly speeded up the rate of innovation because the innovations could have spread a lot further. And in fact, that would be my guess for the farming re revolution is more about those sorts of overlapping trading regions. <laughs> And that the industrial revolution is more about overlapping, or you know, networks of experts communicating, as, uh, rather than uh, coal. So, e economic historians mostly don't like the coal theory, but it's not clear. So, but with uh, with Matt's uh, uh, comment and his utterly heretical uh, uh, decision to uh, to. Uh, say a kind word about fossil fuels. Uh, I, think, uh, I think we'll wrap it up here with the formal discussion. I invite everyone to come upstairs and have lunch. Uh, thank all of you for coming. Thanks, Matt Ridley and Robin Hansen. Thank you very much. Your notes, were you, I mean, your interest. I'll have a copy of that. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um,